I'm going to address a morbid subject today, and that subject is mass extinctions on our planet. Now, mass extinction is defined as when 75% of total estimated species on Earth disappear in a few million years or less, so we're talking about geological time. <clears throat> now, does anyone in this room know how many species live on Earth? No one does, and that's part of the issue. <clears throat> The best estimate for the number of species on Earth is 8.7 plus or minus 1.2 million. So as we proceed through the geologic record, these figures get worse and worse as we go back in time. So that's why I say total estimated species. So who am I? I'm a geologist, <clears throat> and I'm a geologist who works in the ocean. That makes me a marine geoscientist. Now, geologists live bifurcated lives. Outside of work, we think on the time frames that everyone in this room thinks about. Basically from grandparents to grandchildren for a span of about 150 years. <clears throat> if we're keen genealogists, we can look a little farther into time than that. For example, because I have a fairly unusual, if morbid, surname myself, Coffin, um, <clears throat> I can trace the name Coffin back to the Norman invasion of England in 1066 AD. But that's a thousand years, plus or minus. And a thousand years is nothing to a geologist. When I go to work, I think on time scales of hundreds of thousands to millions to tens of millions to hundreds of millions to billions of years. And what I'm going to do next is take you through a brief history of the 4.6 billion years of Earth and highlight a few of the major events. So this is a geological clock meant to represent the 4.6 billion years of Earth history that we've experienced so far, and it's estimated that the planet will survive for another 5 billion years before the sun consumes us as it expands into a giant. At about 4 billion years ago, life first appeared on our planet. So fairly early in our planet's history did we see the first evidence of life. At about 3.5 billion years ago, photosynthesis started. At 2.3 billion years ago, oxygen became rich in our atmosphere, enabling life forms like us to eventually come, because we need oxygen. Between 750 and 635 million years ago, the Earth froze over completely twice. This is called snowball Earth. You can imagine if this happened today, it might not be too good for us. At 543 million years ago, there was a huge explosion of life. We call this the Cambrian explosion. And it essentially represents the transition from single cell life, oftentimes without even a cell nucleus, to multicellular life. So this really is a, a turning point or a major milestone in the development of life on Earth. Between 200 <coughs> And 30 and about 65 million years ago was the reign of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs ruled the Earth for about 165 million years, probably the most successful dominance of any species. And to show where we are on this geological clock, hominids, our ancestors, first appeared 2 million years ago, and our species showed up 200,000 years ago. So compared with the 135 million year reign of dinosaurs, we're only 200,000 years into our <coughs> reign. Very quick, <coughs> short time in geo geological sense. In the 19th century, there was a raging scientific controversy about how the Earth evolved. And this pitted the leading French scientist of the day, Georges Cuvier, against the leading British scientist of the day. This is not the first French-British confrontation, by the way. <laughs> the French promoted the idea of catastrophism, that the Earth was punctuated by major catastrophes in its history, but then nothing much happened in between. Whereas the British were proponents of the view that, well, the uniform processes that we see operating on the face of the Earth today are basically the same as happened in the 4.6 billion years of Earth history preceding right now. Well, Derek Ager, a <clears throat> famous British geologist of the 20th century, summarizes very succinctly the catastrophic view that, 
Much like war, there are long periods of boredom separated by short periods of terror. And eventually, again, it's kind of anomalous in, in, in the history of the 19th and 20th century, the French beat the English, in, in this case, in, in the scientific controversy because the catastrophist view of the world came to be the um, operating paradigm for how we view things. And mass extinctions definitely fall into the category of catastrophic events. So let's look at the big extinction events in Earth history. And on this diagram, I've highlighted the big five. There have been five mass extinctions in Earth history that have eliminated 75% or more of the species existing, the estimated species, as I highlighted earlier. And these range in age from just over 400 million years ago to 65 million years ago. And we're all familiar with the 65 million year event because that's when the dinosaurs disappeared because an extraterrestrial object crashed into Earth. <laughs> now, the number of species that were eliminated in each of these events ranges from just over 75% to up to 96%. And the 96% was 250 million years ago. We call that the Permian. Now, we geologists speak in a language that's often unintelligible. We speak in a jargon that most people <clears throat> would just roll their eyes if they heard about. So the names you see here, Ordovician, Devonian, Permian, Triassic, Cretaceous, is how we refer to periods of time. And we refer to these periods as eons, eras, epochs, periods, ages that have varying lengths from hundreds of thousands to even a billion years. But when you see these five names, you'll recognize them as the end of actually a ge geological period. And how we look at these in the geologic record is we look at the fossils and we see, wow, there's a big change right at that boundary, at the end of the Permian, for example. And completely new life forms take over. So that's how these are defined in the geologic record, in the fossil record. Taking a look at what are the characteristics of these mass extinctions? I've highlighted here in red some of the characteristics. And these sound pretty familiar with what's happening today. Glacial, interglacial cycles, transgressions and regressions, which are the ebbing and flowing of sea level up and down, carbon dioxide changes, global warming, oceanic anoxia, when the oceans lose their oxygen, ocean acidification. So this is looking into the present day as well, but these are the five big events in the past. And then in green, I've highlighted the drivers, or suspected drivers, of these mass extinctions. And my own personal research involves both of these, impacts from outer space, as well as massive volcanism on a scale we don't see happening on Earth today. So let's take a look at these two drivers first. We'll look at the impact event. OK, so this is 65 million years ago. A rock 10 kilometers in diameter coming from space at 20 kilometers per second impacts into the ocean off Mexico. It digs a hole 30 kilometers deep and 100 kilometers across. So what happens environmentally when this happens? Well, <clears throat> all of the ocean that's underneath that 100 kilometer diameter vaporizes. And all of the rock that was there is either vaporized or thrown into space, and some of it far into space. It might even escape Earth's orbit. You would have earthquakes larger than anything humans have experienced, magnitude 9, such as the Japanese earthquake three years ago, pales in comparison. These are magnitude 10, 11, and 12 earthquakes that essentially represent the Earth ringing like a bell for days, if not weeks, after this impact. You'd also have mega tsunamis, not on the 1 to 10 meter scale that we saw uh, in Japan a few years ago, but tsunamis on the scale of 10 to 100 meters, more than 100 meters. You'd have something bigger than hurricanes, which we call hypercanes, because the atmosphere is so disrupted by <clears throat> the impact of this body that storms would persist worse than the ones that hit the Philippines a few months ago. Because the ejecta that's been thrown up into space comes down <clears throat> quickly, it is red hot, it sets off global wildfires. Because all the material throws up, that's thrown up stays in the atmosphere a while, sunlight is not able to reach the surface of the Earth, so you have global cooling. 
call that a uh, cosmic winter event. And finally, when all that stuff has settled down, <clears throat> the ozone layer has been destroyed. So ultraviolet radiation, a thousand times stronger than what we experience today, impacts Earth and essentially mutates the DNA of all higher life forms and causes cancer on a scale unimaginable by today's standard. So whenever you think you're having a bad day at work, <laughs> think about 65 million years ago. The other main driver is flood volcanism, and I took this picture a couple of years ago because it looked like Mount Wellington was erupting. This is not photoshopped at all. Uh, but 180 million years ago, Mount Wellington was erupting. Those organ pipes, basalts at the top of Mount Wellington, they're the easternmost extent of a huge volcanic province that extends from here through Antarctica over to South Africa. And that was erupting 180 million years ago. What that does to drive environmental changes such as mass extinctions is to put a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which promotes global warming, which can increase temperatures dramatically over time spans of 100,000 to a million years. So we can think conceptually of these environmental stressors in a way that <clears throat> is depicted on this diagram. We have any, an environmental stressor, and then we have a response. So let's just say the environmental stressors, stressor is carbon dioxide. And let's say the response is the extent of sea ice in the Antarctic. So we change carbon dioxide slightly in the atmosphere. That's on the bottom axis. And in a safe operating zone, we can change that and nothing much happens with Arctic sea ice. But then we increase the level of carbon dioxide enough and we get into this zone of uncertainty, this striped band in the middle. And in that zone, very small changes can flip things so that we come to a new equilibrium, which is on the right-hand side of the slide. So in this case, we're in the zone of uncertainty for Arctic sea ice. We all have been seeing the satellite pictures that in the summer, the extent of Arctic sea ice has been getting less and less and less. And we basically know that the problem is greenhouse gases. Are we doing anything about it? And the answer is, you all know the answer as well. No, we're not doing much about it. But you can apply this sort of thinking to most, if not all, environmental stressors. And carbon dioxide is just one of them that I picked as an example. A group of workers at Stockholm University, led by Johan Rostrum, has tried to quantify what stressors are actually impacting us severely. And they've defined a zone that's safe, which is depicted in green on this diagram, and then the red areas are where we're in this zone of uncertainty. And you can see here what these are. Um, familiar things like climate change, ocean acidification, ozone depletion, nitrogen phosphorus cycle, <clears throat> global fresh water use, change in land use, biodiversity loss, atmospheric aerosol loading, chemical pollution, like we heard about earlier today, plastics are one of those chemicals. Where we're in this zone of uncertainty has to do with climate change, has to do with biodiversity loss, and it has to do with the nitrogen cycle. Now you understand the first two, but the last one's a bit obscure. Because of our agricultural needs, we're actually withdrawing more nitrogen from the Earth's system than is done by natural causes. And this is really upsetting the nitrogen, and we see this with um, dead zones in the ocean, for example, where this pollution by essentially nitrogen and phosphate is, is causing these dead zones. So we have three areas where we're in this zone of uncertainty. And this is the present day. So I've talked to you about the big five mass extinctions in the past. What can we learn about the present day from how we're stressing our environment? This diagram <coughs> is probably one of the scariest I'm going to show you. This is from the United Nations Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And what it shows on the left-hand side is what we know from the distant geological past about extinction rates, which is the vertical axis. And along the bottom axis are various animal species that are well studied. So that purple bar shows what the extinction rate was in the geological past. And we see that it's 
less than one extinction per thousand species per thousand years. Well, what's happening now? These are known extinctions, humans being the cause of most of them. We see that the extinction rate is more than 100 times what the background extinction rate was determined from fossil record. And modeling of what future extinction rates will be is 1,000 times higher than the background extinction rate. And we are driving this, the human species. So where is this leading us to? Well, on this plot, we have something similar on the left-hand side, which is extinction rate. Along the bottom, we have the magnitude of the extinction, so 75% being the definition of the mass extinction. We've got the big five mass extinctions, Devonian, Triassic, Ordovician, Permian, Cretaceous. <clears throat> this band here is the extinction rate, shows us the extinction rate for those mass extinction events. So where are we now in the present day on this? Well, these workers, uh, led by Anthony Barnowski at the University of California, Berkeley, looked at various species, but particularly focused on uh, terrestrial vertebrates. And the IUCN, or the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, characterizes the state of various animals as being critically endangered, endangered, or vulnerable. So they looked at critically endangered species and they looked at threatened species, which includes all three categories. <clears throat> and what they found was the extinction rates currently for these terrestrial vertebrates that are pictured here are 100 to 1,000 times higher than what we observe in the geological past for the big five extinction events. The scariest calculation in their paper, in their work, is this one. If, and this is if, if all threatened species become extinct in the next 100 years, it will take us only 240 to 540 years to reach mass extinction, 75% of all species gone. If only the critically endangered ones, the ones that are very likely to become extinct anyway, <coughs> are eliminated in the next 100 years, then we've got 890 to 2,270 years until we reach the 75% mass extinction. So we can summarize what the future might look like if this comes to pass. Instead of a world of gorillas, pandas, birds of paradise, and corals, our descendants will have to do with rats, cockroaches, thistles, and nettles. These are the species, the last ones, that get along well with humans. We could add feral cats to that as well, because they get along with humans. The ones that don't get along with humans so well are the ones that get eliminated. So I think we're conducting a vast planetary experiment, and we're doing this knowingly, that's stressing the ecosystem in multiple, myriad ways. And we're probably the only species that's been able to do this in 4.6 billion years of Earth history. I'm Closing on this sober, sobering note, we face challenges into the future as to how we can address this. Probably the grandest challenge for the human species is how we address and alleviate these pressures we're putting on the environment. And I close on this sobering note that life on the planet will continue, but it's not going to be life as we know it now. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.